And now, right to your host of this House of Musicians, Barry Smith. Hey, fine listener. Welcome to this House of Musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101. We hope you enjoy the next hour with us as we do our small part to help promote musicians, bands, and of course, Gary, venues. Mr. Labar, how are you this evening? I'm fine. And speaking of venues, did you not find this fantastic artist you have on tonight at a venue? I found him at a venue. There I you- found him <laughs> at Sir Monty's Brewery in Curtis. Um, the owners, who are friends of mine, um, uh, found him at another uh, gay, uh, venue and asked him to come over and play for a party that we had there. So, uh, And he was amazing. Of course, I'm talking about um, Matt Gunn. Matt was born and raised in a small town, Ontario, a multi-instrument singer-songwriter. Uh, Matt combines a mix of soul, Motown, and reggae to prove the world there's more to uh, the country than just honky-tonks and cowboy boots. He's influenced by Van Morrison, Marvin Gaye, the Slackers. Uh, Matt creates a blend of sounds to soothe even the pickiest of ear- eardrums. Um, and, and we have him on the show. Uh, please help me say hello to Mr. Matt Gunn. Matt, how you doing, bud? I'm amazing. How are you? I'm doing good, bud. As I said, I saw you playing at Sir Monty's Brewery in Curtis, um, and uh, I was just amazed for one guy sitting on a, on a bar stool with an acoustic. Uh, the range that you had, the songs, the different songs that you were playing, they weren't standard cover songs that most bands play. I think a lot of the songs that you played were originals. Um, we, I ended up leaving with two of your albums. Uh, and what I love about <clears throat> the original albums is they're on vinyl, man. That's just too cool uh, for this day and age, especially since I click collect vinyl. Um, Matt, I just want to, let's start the show off. I just want to ask you how, when then we'll get into your music and your songs and play, even play a couple songs, how you were influenced by music growing up and who were you influenced by? Um, I got into it. I mean, as a kid, I like, I'm a tall, lanky guy, so I'm non-athletic. I'm about as, as like as least athletic as a human can be. So I can't <laughs> run or catch or throw or anything, but, uh, yeah, I remember I was probably, oh, I think I was in the sixth grade, just coming up on grade seven. And my older brother who I was never allowed to touch anything, he was going out to a party and he had a bass and, uh, I asked him if I could play it. And for some random reason, he said, yes. And he showed me this book of tabs he had printed because, you know, we had dial up internet and you, you, you couldn't, you, the internet wasn't the same. And, uh, and so by the end of the night, he showed me how to read tab. And by the end of the night, I could play the whole book. And I finally found something I, I wasn't bad at. And it just kind of comes naturally. I, I find. And then from there on out, like I, I listened to a whole lot of punk rock, bands like rancid and no effects and uh and just like you know i spent a lot of time just laying in my bed with my headphones and 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 letting that take me i didn't read much but that was my those were my novels all these all these records and they spoke to me and i just wanted to do it i wanted to do it so badly it was also kind of like the cool thing to do at the time like i was in a band before i could even play an instrument like it was, i don't know it was just like what what was cool on the scene and uh, so, yeah, and I just never stopped doing it. I remember uh, I bought, I got a, an electric guitar for, for Christmas, and then I bought a drum kit off of a guy, and I just built a whole studio in my basement, and I just never looked back. I went to school for audio recording and engineering, and I just, like, I eat, sleep, and breathe music. You sure do. And so, you, of course, you play a lot of instruments. The drums that you have in your studio, you play those as well. I do. I play all the instruments because I have no friends. But, uh, but I, yeah, I play, um, I started with the bass and then the guitar and then the drums and then singing kind of fell in somewhere around there. And then I picked up the piano and the saxophone and I'm slowly learning flute over this lockdown that we had. Good for but, you. So let's yeah. go ahead. Yeah, that was it. That was it. <laughs> so um, let me uh, tell me about um, when the first time what, so you learned how to play bass. Do, we, do you remember the first song you learned on bass? Oh, yeah. it Was, it was, was it probably, dazed and confused? <laughs> no, no. It was way cheesier than that. It was it was uh, Blink-182, if I had to guess. Okay, that's simple, cool. Just super simple, 
one, no walking, nothing fancy. You just kind of follow along what the guitar is playing. And so therefore I kind of had the knack for it. And then, and then after that, I was, I was just really into like Motown and anything bass driven. And, and like, I don't know, I feel like I just love the rhythm side of music. Like, I feel like it's very common for most guitar players and, and instruments. They, they just want to play the guitar solos and they want to be the star. And I was more like, I want to play the song. Hey, man, I agree. I have four or five bass guitars here, and I've recorded my music um, in studios playing a lot of bass on my songs. And uh, I, I like the bass. I have to be honest. <clears throat> I'm a guitar player and have been all my life, but I like the bass just as much. That deep rumble and feel, and when you're when you're on key with the drummer and the kick connects with the with the note that you're playing, it's just it's there's no other feeling, man. Bass is an amazing instrument, right? Absolutely. When you fit in that pocket, it's just there's nothing like it. And you can have a lot of bands that just have guitars or or just uh, have acoustics uh, on stage and whatnot, but. When you're gonna when you're gonna let it all out, man, you gotta have a, a good bass guitar there. That's for sure. So absolutely yeah. dig the bass. Um, do you remember? So you learned bass first. Um, yeah. do, okay, let's let's step ahead a bit. Then you then you learn guitar, then drums. So do you remember the first time and how old you might be when you actually played for an audience and what that was like? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I got a guitar. I got a bass guitar for my twelfth birthday. So it was just shortly after. I was allowed to play my brother's bass and uh, I got one for my birthday. So it, it was an applause that they found at circuit city. I think it was like, you know, it was like 50 bucks or something. Turned out it's an applause bass from the seventies, which is uh, a solid body brand that ovation made. So I learned this much later. I still have the thing. It's like, it's so heavy and it's all worn and I had stickers all over it, which are half peeled off, which pulled the paint off. And that year uh, we were playing for at backyard parties. Like I, I played that year. Oh, it wasn't good. Don't get me wrong. We were not good at all, but I didn't care. And right. you don't have to be good in punk rock. That's the whole point. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it was that year. So I was in grade, I was 12 years old playing for audiences it already like you know you can tell it punk, punk rock's an acquired taste so like if you play it it's very common that you'll get put into the wrong gig and people might not appreciate it as much as you do so i got used right. to that really early on yeah absolutely man I, I can understand that you're going to uh you know your friend's birthday party and their folks listen to johnny cash and waylon jennings and now you're pulling out the punk stuff that's uh that's kind of uh brave and admirable oh yeah we got uh, i remember in high school one of the music teachers was like yeah we're putting on this new this christmas concert your band should play and at that point we played like a punk ska and oh yeah you could just see the whole place like plugging their ears and turning their heads and we just turned the amps up and like all right well we got to get through the end of this set but yeah, uh, nope. but yeah so no you just kind of learn you kind of learn that you know it's all about the music and how you feel the audience is always going to like it if you get put on the wrong gig absolutely so how long did it how, how many years went by uh from the punk uh playing the punk stuff live did you start getting into other music i i played it was punk rock till about uh for for about two years and then we got into ska and uh, and that was when I switched over from the bass and started playing an electric guitar because I, I picked one up. It was a, a Squire Bullet hardtail, like the cheapest electric guitar they possibly make that Long and McQuaid would sell. And um, I had one of those, like it sounds like a tin can and I didn't care. I spray painted it and we played ska and I couldn't actually like play bar chords or proper chords on the guitar. Cause I was more used to bass and, and my, my ring finger was a little bit useless at the time. Cause in bass, you use more of your pinky. And, uh, and I just would play these ska chords, like the, the top half of the, of the strings and we joined this ska band and we actually did pretty well. I mean, I liked it, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so we played ska up for another three years. And then uh, after that, I had fallen into the classic rock and we got into more rock and roll and a little more like grungier. And then um, 
And so that would have been, yeah. And that was for another two years when I went to school for audio recording, I recorded that band. And then after that, I kind of just, I got an acoustic guitar because I found I had trouble writing music on an electric guitar. I felt that every time I picked it up, I'd just start noodling or I just, you know, I'd wanted to turn it up and, and crank something out. I, I felt as far as like adding quality and depth into my songwriting, I always wrote best on an acoustic guitar. So I stuck with that. And that's when my finger picking and my acoustic guitar kind of developed. And I started playing a lot softer music and uh, a little more mainstream. And nowadays I just kind of blend it all into one sound. Yeah, it's amazing when you play acoustic how <coughs> excuse me, you um you really do play softer songs. I find that too. Um I have electrics and acoustics and when you plug the electric in you I want it through a you know, a, a twin reverb with a couple of distortion pedals or, or the board, the boss GT ten and crank it up and, and and when you're playing an acoustic you, you it's it, there's no really room for that so you really learn murray mclaughlin songs and gordon lightfoot songs and, and what james taylor songs too so yeah exactly uh, you know so absolutely um what, what do you like playing better what what instrument oh out of all of them or you mean between the electric and the acoustic yeah i guess out of all of them. well they, i mean I, this bass is certainly my strongest so if i am hearing somebody play I can always hear the rhythm come to me and I just want to go up and join them and, and play. So like bass is probably like my all time favorite. If I couldn't play any other one, well, actually that's, I, I take that back because I survive as a musician right now on my acoustic guitar. So like I play the acoustic the most. Um, and, and I feel like the drums can be the most fun to play live. Like, there's just something about it. It gives you that whole rock and roll feel have a couple of drinks and go out there and just beat the skins. And they each kind of have their own, their own place. But I found that more and more and more, my electric guitar seems to be plugged in less and less. However, I did come across in 2019, I bought a Gretsch streamliner, full hollow body. I never thought in my life I would ever own one of these guitars, but I, uh, I went around playing the acoustic for three years on the road, four nights a week. And I felt like my my Les Paul felt like a ukulele because it's just so little compared to the big acoustic where you can sit your arm on it and everything. Sure. And so I got this Gretsch. I mean, it's amazing. It's only 500 bucks with a case. And uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's, it sounds like an electric, but it plays like an acoustic. I can sit my arm on it. It's nice and big for my lanky body. And I love that thing. So I have many a guitars just collecting dust now that I found this thing. But, uh, right. yeah, it, it's kind of tough. I, I don't know which one would be my absolute favorite. But um, I'd say it, if I had to just choose one, I could continue on being the musician that I am with just an acoustic guitar. But right. uh, when I record, I, I'm, I hear the song just develop in my head as soon as I start writing it. So I kind of just like, I, when it comes to studio time, I, I'm just already know what to play on everything before I even do it. Yeah. So sure. they, all, they, they all have their pieces. They all have their, their spots that I, so I, I love them all. I can't, I can't choose. That's good. That's a good thing. I'm um, going in the studio is an amazing uh, experience. That's for sure. Uh, when you get one track down and, and, and then you're uh, overdubbing onto the tracks and making new tracks with different instruments, especially if you're doing it by yourself and you watch the song grow and maybe change a couple things as you go. I found when I was recording, I'd write my songs at home on an acoustic. And when I got it, by the time I got in the studio and three other people played on it and I've done a, two or three tracks myself, that song is, usually not exactly what I thought in my head when I was playing it at home on the acoustic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't usually yeah. turn out that way. How about for you? Um, I find some something similar. I find uh, what I used to do was I would write all the parts and record all the parts with a, like some simple demo of like just one mic set up and I didn't care. I was more of in the writing mode. And I would make these demos of low quality and then it would be time and be like, all right. And I would rent a couple of microphones, right? You know, it was time to actually mic up the kit properly and do all that stuff. And I found that 
every single time I loved the emotion and the power that came from the demo. So I felt like that. I have quite a few songs where I wasted the good one on the demo. So now I just will, I'll record it on my phone, just the acoustic guitar and no other part gets written. I just kind of hear it in my head. Um, and uh, I make sure that I save it for the, for the recording because like it has to, it, you'll never get that again. You'll never get that power. The, the, the polished versions just sound like a polished version of what I wanted. They don't sound like the captured raw emotion of the very first time, not necessarily the first take, but that night, you know, and, and being the guy that's playing all the instruments, I do have the ability of uh, communicating what I want to myself. You know, I, I don't, I find it sometimes it's difficult to, to work with other musicians when, uh, you know, you, you kind of have a vision of how it's going and the drummer's playing the groove a little bit differently and therefore that would change where the bass guitar is going to sit and the whole song kind of turns out to be a totally different groove. Not necessarily bad, but it just ends up being different. And uh, I find I, I'm lucky enough that I'm, I'm that one guy. So when I, what I'm hearing in my head is easy to communicate to the bass player because it's also me. That's right. I agree. I enjoy doing uh, multiple takes of instruments myself when I'm in the studio as well. Um, I got an email here and I want to read it to you. It's from Ralph and Ralph asks, Hey, is gun really Matt's last name? Just curious. <laughs> it is. It is. I didn't choose it. I was given it. Yeah, there you that's go. my name. Matt, that's, a, that's a good name. That's a good name yeah, uh, right? for a musician, Matt Gunn. Absolutely, buddy. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So let's do this, Matt. Let's play one of your songs. Um, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, now this song. Uh, it's called And So It Begins is off of your first album, correct? It's off the latest one, actually. It's the one I recorded over the lockdown in 2020. Which is um, Staring at Nothing. No, it's off oh, of... I, uh, I, I don't even remember. Yeah, the art, oh, the, the art of imperfection. The, the art of perfection. Yeah. I have it all. I have everything backwards here. I'm sorry. So oh, that's all good. So this is this is the recent one. The art of compre- uh, the art of uh, perf- imper- uh, Sorry, the art of imperfection. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, and again, I love that this is on vinyl. Um, let's go ahead, folks. I have Matt Gunn on the show this evening, and we're going to listen to his song. And so it begins off his album, The Art of Imperfection, right here on this House of Musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101.
fine listener we have matt gunn on the show this evening and we just heard and so it begins matt love the song um tell me all about how you wrote it where it came from uh yeah so i um the, i'll just before i forget the the singer on that with me is cassie noble check her stuff out she's incredible but um yeah I, Take, uh, i'm taking a note oh yeah yeah check her stuff out she's great um, so I wrote it, um, we got, uh, we, I guess we inherited it. I don't know. I don't even know how it showed up. A friend of ours brought a, I dropped off a 114 year old piano at my house and I tuned it all up and started playing it. And I love, I just, I don't know. I kind of picked it up pretty quick and, um, I, I wrote this kind of riff and, and the inspiration for the song is like before I had a lot of songs, I played a lot of covers. And as a, a musician, it, like you don't think that you kind of have to choose, but you kind of have to choose if you're going to write originals or you're going to play covers. And, you know, I, I, in all my other bands, we never played covers. So I've just, you know, just playing open mics and whatever, I would play covers because I would save my originals for all the shows. And so when it came time to do the shows, people were showing up and they were demanding these covers. And, you know, because like, I think in the cover world, you have to just play a song that people forgot they loved. That's the secret to the cover, in my opinion. And uh, people go, oh, I love this song. You know, they haven't heard it forever. Whether it's a good song or not, if they haven't heard it for a long time, they're, they're automatically a little more interested than if you're playing, you know, Landslide and all these songs that are being played so much. So I, I felt that at the time, I kind of had to just, force through and be like i'm not playing those songs i'm gonna play what i want to play i'm sorry guys but like this is what i'm doing and uh you know maybe i lose a couple of people or you know if it took a bit for people to kind of catch on and, and and you know start to learn my songs but that that song is about like how i'm, I'm not gonna give up like i'm gonna do what i want to do and I don't, I don't care what, what, you know, the, the consensus is like, I, I'm a songwriter and I'm sorry that I played all those covers for a year or two, 
I'm going to stick to my guns here and I'm going to play all of my originals. And it was the battle that it was, you know, cause like people just start yelling out like, Oh, play this, play this, play that. And finally it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'm, I'm not going to give up because, you know, you run into some issues because, you know, a lot of the bars don't want your original music. They just want the cover. So then the gigs start kind of disappearing and a lot of stuff just kind of started falling through. And it was like, well, am I making the right call? And I'm like, absolutely I am. So I just, that song just came to me and, and that's kind of what it's about. It's like, I, I'm, I'm done with I have enough material now that I can play two hours with only you know a handful of covers just to spice it up a little bit, but uh, that that song's kind of about that. And um, yeah, sure, yeah. And I I recorded it. The art of imperfection. See, I I don't really like repetitive noise. If somebody's tapping their foot or or the a, a, a tap is dripping, it'll drive me crazy. So therefore, my limitations in music. I can't listen to a lot of electronic based music because it's just the same thing over and over again. Like a, <laughs> I can't, I can't do that. So <laughs> but you do that. Well, you do that yeah. well, but still I, I, I'm in the same boat as you. I can't do it. So, um, I've forever, my entire life have been listening to underground music. I don't listen to a lot of mainstream stuff and I like it to be a little bit raw and edgy. And I found more and more that the, the digital processing, the quantize and the pitch correction are falling deeper and deeper into the underground. And now I can't really escape it. And I feel like there's nothing more upsetting than when you go to a band, or you go to a show and a band like blows your head off with how good they are. And you buy the record and you throw it in the car on the way home and you get some digitized version of what you just heard. And I'm like, why did you auto tune yourself? You're so, you're so good. And, and why are you using fake drums? Your drummer's amazing. And, and, and uh, I never understand that. I mean, lots of people do it and you know, this is only my opinion. And, and but I just, I'm, I'm not into that. And I don't understand why somebody with that much talent would want to do that. So the art of imperfection was to kind of show everybody that it doesn't matter. Like I know a lot of like artists say this, but it was like, I've, you don't need that. In fact, the reason why we like music from the sixties, seventies and nineties is because it doesn't have that. Like the grunge era, at least of the nineties, there's a lot of, there's a lot of commercial stuff and, and overproduced stuff in the nineties as well. But, but if you listen to sixties and seventies, it's like those guys played that. That's what they sounded like. Yeah, and, and, an, and another thing that I have is that as an audio engineer, I, I caught, I went in class of 2007. So it was like, you know, we had all the technology, but home studios are not what they are now. Like, you know, there was no garage band. I mean, it, if there was, it was, it was total garbage and, and there's no, none of these presets and the plugins like aren't nearly what they are now. And, um, and I find that way. It, it, the modern studio is to just, you know, you close mic a guitar amp and then you use settings to make it sound like it's somewhere else. But if we've all played around with it, you realize that there's really only so many settings that sound good. And therefore your mix is just the battle of the settings. Whereas back in the day, they didn't have that. Mobile studios were actually the thing. So when I built my home studio, I put it all in a mobile rack and everything's all in toolboxes and it all hits the road with me. And I, I decided I'm going to find the space, you know, like in that track that we just heard, the piano was actually, I rented the local music hall in my town and because it was during the lockdown. So nobody was there. It's this big empty room and they have this big, beautiful grand piano. And I set up a couple of room mics and I recorded this giant piano. There's no reverb on that, on that track. It's just that. And a lot of the other reverb that i'm looking for is just the hallway outside of my bathroom by the stairs because it's nice and big and echoey and i got mm -hmm. I, I decided i'm gonna find the sounds i'm gonna i'm gonna do that and i wanted that tape sound so like you know i wanted i wanted to do it old school the whole idea was that if you're listening to records from the 60s and 70s and then you put mine on you shouldn't tell the difference that was my objective whether you can or can't i don't know but um i uh so i got uh, re two reel to reel tape machines they're they're quarter inch so they're only two channel but my idea was to record to them and then you know use all that 
but I, I'm noticing that tape's actually a ginormous pain, and I understand why we all switch to digital because you know the tape jams or there's a wrinkle in it, and all of a sudden your take is just like completely useless. It has this big like pop in it, and it's going to peak all the meters, and you just can't use it. So what I did was I faked it and I pretended like I had the tape machine and I recorded with zero cuts or edits. I just press record at the beginning and play all the way through. And at the end, you're either going to like it and live with the mistakes or you're going to record the entire performance again. And I did that with every single track on the entire record is all recorded in one take, not necessarily first take, but one take. And then in order to, so I would sum my channels, like if I have, you know, eight or 10 drum mics, I would sum them through these four channels of analog tape. And then, and so I would have a kick snare and then drum left, drum right. I would just sum it all down and get that analog warmth. But the issue I found was that when the reels are spinning, they never, ever actually spin at the same speed. So you see these old studios with so much gears because when you were running 16 channels and you're going to copy it to another tape, well, you have to dump all 16 channels at once because you you'll never get it to go again because the machines just don't spin at the same like at least the ones i have and so in order to get to bypass that i had to take them apart and hotwire them so that the playhead would work in record mode so that my signal would then hit the tape and then be played off immediately after and i would record it onto another computer so it's going basically from digital time clock to another digital time clock and i bypass the reels so uh, it was a whole complicated mad scientist project, but it worked. And so everything was summed via tape and it has that hiss and it has that warmth. And uh, that's what the art of imperfection is. It's just like, it doesn't matter. And, and what, what I really loved about it was that because it didn't matter, there, were, like, there was no anxiety towards it. Usually when I record, I've done 10 records like throughout all my bands and my history of, of recording. And, you know, by the end of it, you're just like, like I, when I did Staring at Nothing, I recorded the bed tracks in Germany. And then when I came back, I can just always hear all the little mistakes. And that bothered me at the time. And so I would shelf it for six months because that album was recorded in August 2017, but released in September 2018. So it took a year for me to, you know, forget about all the mistakes. And then when I listened back, I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty good. And then I did the vocals and stuff on top of it. So for this one, because I just I didn't care about any of that. I recorded the entire thing in five weeks, and it was done and, and mixed and ready to go. And uh, just every time it was like, oh, it doesn't matter, right? It, it doesn't matter. You know, you're supposed to be able to hear, you know, the sticks hit each other, and you're supposed to be able to hear my roommate walking down the hall. And, and you know, that's the whole point of it is that because you know most really awesome tunes that are legendary are kind of recorded it, it, like they're staticky and they're hiccupy. You listen to like old Stax record stuff. It, it's a hissy and, you know, you can hear Marvin Gaye stomping his feet and like, you know, it, like, it doesn't matter because nobody's paying attention to that. They just love the groove of the song. So this was my push on what it means to just make music from people, you know, like it's supposed to have all these issues in it. And, uh, and yeah, so th this whole project was just one big push on just like, you don't have to be perfect. You, you just like, just play it. People are going to like that way better. And uh, this is my example of what music played by people sounds like. And, and you know, it's so easy for us to just, you know, if, you, if any of you are, are recording engineers, or you have the gear, you just right click on the wave file and hit quantize and it'll make it perfect. But you're going to lose that emotion. And like in one of my songs on the record, um, the, the whole groove of it is that the snare is just so close to being out of time. That's like, it, it's not out of time, but it's as far out as it can possibly be. It's late, but, but still there. And it just adds this like flow to it. And it's, these are things that you would never achieve when you're using digital processing and, and digital instruments. I, I feel like, you know, my theory is that if you made a whole record write everything digitally and then go find people to play the exact same thing but on real instruments you will see what i'm talking about and uh and it's kind of hard to explain but that's what this whole art of imperfection is it was like none of it matters leave the issues and the errors into your music because it's what makes it like even on that last song we heard at the like three quarters of the way through it cuts down to just piano 
And, and then when uh, I come back in, I hit the wrong chord. I just like mashed the keys, but I left it because uh, I had that was the best take, and I was refusing to make the cut. And when you listen back, nobody can hear it. Maybe you'll hear it if you guys listen back. You might hear what I'm talking about, but I don't care. It's in there. It's it's, it's what it is, and it's a, it's a story to tell. And, uh, and yeah, so that's kind of what I'm pushing for this. And, and from, from here on out, that's how I want to do the music. It's just one take all the way through, you know, I saw a video of Freddie Mercury recording and they're just like, okay, do the harmony. And he just sings it one try, it writes a prince and then they rewind it and they're like, okay, the third part. And he sings it and it's done. He's just like firing these things off. He's that good. And I just want to be that good at playing. I, I, I I've, I feel like I, I like hearing my mistakes in my recording or things that, I mean, you can always do it better, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be. And I feel like, you know, if my voice cracks or I blew a tire singing when I'm playing live and I'm coming up to that part, my brain goes, Hey, you have to try hard right now because you suck at this part. Remember? And then therefore I never do it anymore. And I get better and better. And I start playing more and more of my songs and they get tighter and tighter. And I listen back to recordings and I'm like, Oh wow, I've really improved. But you know, if, if it was never you and you're never hearing these issues, then you'll never know. And you will stay at the, at the skill set that you have every single time because you need somebody to point out, Hey, you're not good at this part. Remember? And uh, unfortunately only you have the ability to do that. And to change it, I mean, you know, you know, Matt, I agree with you a hundred percent. A great example of what we're talking, what you're talking about right now is most of Neil Young's repertoire. Um, it's what, that's who comes to mind. I don't, I just cannot see Neil Young recording uh, the, the albums that he did over and over and takes over and over. And it doesn't sound like he did. There's lots of mistakes in his songs. The notes and some of the guitars are off. Um, and I'm sure he's like that live too. But I, I, I know where you're coming from. Raw, first time. Uh, is usually is usually the best you know like there's a lot of over published um i don't know if published is the word but over over uh harmonized and like you say pitch finders and 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 over computerized music out there and people are doing that on purpose to make everything perfect and i'm totally on your side for it to be raw and and like i say the the only the best example i come up with would be neil young yeah, no, I'm with you a hundred percent. And if you think of like time is money in the studio and they're need like if you, if this was 1971, let's say I pulled that out of thin air. If we, if it was, if this was the day and we were going into the studio and we had, you know, a 10 hour day, we would spend most of that time finding the sounds and tweaking things and making sure everything was in phase. And we'd probably spend five, six hours finding the sounds. And then it's like, okay, now play it. Like, you, you know, you, the tape only, you only have two or three tries before you start degrading the tape and adding a disgusting amount of hiss. So it's like, you, you know, you have to be able to do it. When the time comes, we're going to spend all our time finding the cool sounds and capturing the, the realness of it. And then it's up to you, the musician, to do your part and play it. You know, you and don't do it the first like time. Now it's, yeah, it's like, and, and what I find is in making records is we spend so much time editing and trying to find the right one. It's like, well, if we listen, if we played, you know, 13 takes, in order to find it, I had to go through 13 takes again. So I would have to experience that entire day again as the editing engineer and finding it and tweaking it and doing all this work. And that would take forever. So I was just like, oh, I'm just going to do it. We're going to keep this take or we're going to do the other take. You know, you're, you only need to do about three or four because you're really not going to get any better than that. I agree. Without and, machinery, uh, I agree. Yeah, exactly. And this is like, that's the best that I could play at the time. And that's what it sounds like. And if you listen back to my old records, you'll hear that I have gotten a lot better. <laughs> Well, yeah, more time spent doing it, that's for sure, and understanding stuff. I recorded, let's say, I've, I've recorded maybe 50 songs, they're all online, but I, um, one song I recorded, I think it was the last one I did, maybe the second last on my home studio, I wrote the song as I was recording it. So I knew I already had the, uh, the rhythm down for the guitar, so I played that track and got through it, 
But when it came to the lyrics, I actually wrote the song. Uh, okay, I record. And then she went down to the river and pressed stop. Okay, what am I going to write next? So I wrote <laughs> the whole cool. song, recording it at the same time. Wow, the first that's time awesome. I, first time I ever did it. And it's nothing like, it's not special or it's not, it's not, um, you know, experience or intelligent or anything. It's just the way I chose to do it. It seemed to work good for me to be able to write the song while I was recording it instead of pre pre writing it. But it's the first time I've ever done that. Matt, let's, um, I have two vinyl albums here. Let's tell the folks, my friend, um, great music, all original. That's 20, one, one, two, three, four, five, uh, 10, 15, 20 songs you have here. Again, they're on vinyl, which I absolutely adore. Tell the folks where they can get these albums and, and, and see you, um, um, online. Uh, I mean, the, the best and fastest way would be on my website, uh, macgunmusic.com. Uh, I don't have a purchase feature. Just go on the contact and send me a link that you want it. And I'll, uh, if you're in Durham region, I'll just drop it off at your place. And otherwise, I'll ship it to you. They're 20 bucks each plus shipping. And uh, yeah, if I found that I couldn't really give away CDs anymore. I, you know, nobody has a CD player. So I went with the vinyl and uh, yeah, it seems to be coming back. Like people really want them. Well, vinyl stone. So nostalgic. I absolutely love vinyl. You got the covers, you got the inserts, you got the writing all over it. Um, um, I love personally love the sound of vinyl. I have a good turntable and receiver and I personally love the sound of it. People will argue that digital is better. I'm not one of those guys. I, I just love to put on a, a vinyl album when now for me, when I listen to vinyl, it seems like I can pick out everything that's in that song. Whereas if it's digital, it's harder to pick out what's in that song, the noises, um, the instruments, um, the vocals. It just seems to be easier to pick it out. Uh, there's more, it seems, it seems to be more fuller from, an, from a vinyl album. Um, and so many people will disagree and say that uh, digital is better. But I'm one of the vinyl guys that thinks that it sounds better. Yeah, I'm also one of the vinyl guys. I agree. It sounds kind of like you're in the room versus you're, exactly. listening to the song. But I will say that as far as the mastering goes, you, too much low end on a vinyl will cause your needle to skip and too much high end. In fact, high end causes distortion really quickly on a vinyl. So you have to round that off too. So if you picture that when, we're, when you get in the car and you're tweaking your stereo, the first thing you do is you boost the bass for the low end and you boost the high end and you make, create what they call the hi-fi smile, right? You pull the mids out. You That's boost right. the lows and you boost the highs. But what, what you get on vinyl is you can't do that because you would then jump the needle if you had too much low. And as soon as you boost the highs, you start to get distortion. So what you're getting is a lot of mid-range. And though we like the warmth and the sparkle of, of the, you know, the lows and the highs, but the mid-range is actually where all information comes from. All instruments are fighting for that one low mid area between 300 and 500 hertz is where everything is. And that becomes really predominant on a vinyl. So that's why it's easier to kind of pick out, oh, I didn't realize there was a tambourine in this song, or, or I had never heard that melodica in the background before. And, and you, you'll notice that on the vinyl, whereas in the digital, though I'll admit, in the car, you can really pump up a CD best than anything. As far as like pretending you're in a concert, I'll admit I can turn a CD up the loudest. But you lose a lot of just in that low end and in the sparkle, all that definition kind of gets lost. Though, yeah, it blows your hair back and it's cool and it makes you drive faster than you should. But if you want to actually <laughs> yeah. sit and listen to and hear all of that, that you know, hear everything in the mix and you can, you, know, you can hear the floorboards crack and it sounds like you're there, that's the vinyl mix itself is what gives you that. So, like, is it better? It depends what you want. But I, I'm more pro vinyl than I am pro digital. In fact, on the Art of Imperfection, I, I've met, both my records actually are mixed for vinyl, and they were recorded for vinyl. And then nice. I just made a digital version of it. And on the Art of Imperfection, I didn't even redo the mix. I just squashed the output till it was at digital levels, and I sent it off. So I'm like, ah, buy the vinyl if you want to hear what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah, sure, man. And, you know, it helps, too. I, back in the old days, uh, uh, when it was just turntables, uh, later in that era, 
Um, big speakers came out with cabinets and cloth coverings over them, and, and that makes a big difference. You don't have that nowadays with CDs. They're all little tiny speakers that um, that that are still, some are real powerful, and they sound real good, but not like the old days with the six-foot, you know, the four-foot by two-foot speaker cabinets, and you got four of them in your basement in each corner pumping. I mean, all that makes a big difference, too. You're not oh, ever yeah. going to get get a car stereo to sound like that, even though there's some amazing car st- stereos as well. Yeah, I'm so, like but that. that's what, that's what vinyl guys will say for sure. Matt, let's do this. Um, folks, I want you to check out, um, Matt guns, go check them out online. And Matt told you if you buy a album off him, um, and he, it's in Durham region, he will, uh, here in Ontario, he will, uh, He'll come over and deliver it to you, and I bet he'd sign it for you, too, because these albums are fabulous. Let's listen to another one of Matt's songs here called Pretty Little Liars. Off, again, The Art of Imperfection, his latest album right here on this House of Musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101.
Hey, welcome back, friendly, fine listeners. We have Matt Gunn on the show this evening, and we just listened to Pretty Little Liars, his very own tune off his album, The Art of Imperfection. Tell me about that song, Matt. Uh, That song is about kind of the downside you get, you find in rock and roll where, you know, people think they know you and they love you, but they really have no idea like anything about you. They just love the image that you portray on the stage. I, I found as, uh, you know, the more I played, the more I ran into that. It's like, you know, you, you meet somebody and you start hanging out and then a few months go by and you realize it's like, do you know anything about me? Like, are you just like, you know, you just kind of hanging out here because I, I'm playing music or do you actually like to spend time with me? And uh, mm. that's what that song's about. Yeah. And perfectly clear in the song. That's for sure. <laughs> Matt, tell me a crazy story that's happened to you. It's a favorite part of my show. Um, I ask all the artists, something crazy on the road. I know you were in Germany for six months um, playing your music. And and uh, so anything on a bus, a tour bus, on a plane, on stage, something crazy that's happened to you. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm pretty laid back. However, okay, when I was in Germany, I moved to Hamburg and I was there for six months. And, um, I wanted to play. And so I walked down to the Reaper bond, which is like the big party area. And I'm looking for bars that would let me play like my originals. And, uh, I wander up to this Irish pub called Murphy's Tavern and I go in there and I'd been in a couple of times and I noticed that it's certain nights they do have a, like a singer songwriter in the corner because a lot of the spots, it's like, you know, a bit like they want big cover bands where it's like, there's not a lot of room for a, a man and his guitar. So I, um, I found this one place and I asked the guy like, Hey, if I want to play here, what do I do? How do I do that? Like, I've noticed you have people play and the guy working is like, okay, let me, he was from Ireland and he's like, let me see what I can do. Cause I don't speak German. So my communication skills weren't the greatest. And so he goes into the back and he's gone for about 10 minutes. And he comes back and he's like, okay, like here's the name of a bar. I don't remember what it was. And he's like, tonight at 10.30 p.m., you're going to go there and you're going to meet a giant skinhead biker looking guy named Stoffel. And you're going <laughs> to say hi to him and t- tell him you want to play. <laughs> I'm like, uh, OK, so I leave. <laughs> this is only like it was like two in the afternoon. So I'm like, OK, sure, I'll do that because I want to play that badly. So here I am. I take a 40 minute train ride to this other bar somewhere. So that I can, uh, and I, like I'm not. Uh, the, you've seen me. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm maybe 150 pounds soaking wet. Like I'm not exactly, you know, a Hercules. And here I am. I'm gonna. <laughs> I have to now look for the toughest, scariest looking biker in the bar, and I have to approach myself in hopes that they even speak English and that they're the right guy, and then try to ask them for a show. So <laughs> I'm sitting at the bar. <laughs> And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm looking around and scarier and scarier people start coming in because it's a bit of a hole in the wall cross with like a party bar. And uh, and all of a sudden this guy walks in and I'm like, oh, you're who I have to talk to. You are the scariest looking person I've ever seen. And so I go up to him and I just introduce myself and sure enough, I got it right. He turned out to be one of the nicest people I've ever met. And... Uh, and so he gives me the gig. It was about two weeks from then. And he's very short with his communication because he runs a whole bunch of bars. And he's like, yeah, you're going to come that night. And I want you to play three hours. And here's what we're going to pay you. And I'm like, okay, sweet. So I leave, I message him. I'm standing at my house. And I message him. And I'm like, I, uh, I only need my guitar and my patch cord. Like, do I need to bring anything? And he's like, nope, that's great. So then I go to the gig to find out that I'm supposed to provide my own microphone. And there was one at my house that I didn't take because I'm not supposed to bring it. And right. I'm, I'm 40 minutes away, so I can't just run home and grab it. So I just, I don't know, I just disappear in a panic and just start running into all these bars in downtown Germany. I know no one. It's like 9.30 at night. I'm supposed to take the stage in 15 minutes. And I start running around and asking all of these people, like, do you have a 58? Does anybody have a 58? Like, what, what are my chances, right? And sure enough, I walk into a bar that just so happens to be owned by the same guy by coincidence. And the DJ is like, yeah, you can use mine. Because all he would use it for is like, all right, everybody, up next. And whatever, right? Like, he didn't actually need the microphone. 
but he mm-hmm. gave me the microphone, but wouldn't give me the cable because he was not thrilled. So, <laughs> right. So, but now I have a 58, like what are the chances? So then I run all the way back to this gig and I, um, there was some, like, I can't remember what I used, but I duct taped, I had it, my case was all duct taped back together. So I ripped some tape off of my case and I taped it to this broken stand thing. And I, I, bailed on the monitor and I used the XLR cable out of my monitor so that I could have a microphone and I just went wow. for it. That's a great yeah, that's, story, man. That's, that's probably the craziest thing that's happened. The things musicians have to do. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Well, what can I say, Matt? It's been, I was, a, it was an honor to see you play live uh, a few couple of weeks back. It was an honor to have you on the show. Of course, we're going to keep following your progress, but before we go, um, there's a segment of the show I like to do called, well, Gary Labar, what do you think? Well, do we, well, we're going to take a few minutes on this, Barry, if you're okay. We're all set. Okay. I- I'm okay. Okay. First of all, the technical... This guy knows his stuff, doesn't he, Gary? Yes, yes. And that's part of my discussion here. Uh, The technical wizardry, you know, it's not so much the Mike Cabral and that stuff, but man, you know, Matt, you're the Tom Schultz of the modern day world, you know, so... (laughs) But your your music is, to me, influential. I hear some doors in that. Uh, I hear (laughs) hear some... I don't know if you know... How old are you? I just turned 33. Okay. Do you remember, you probably might not, but do you remember a band called Quarter Flash? I don't. Okay. Quarter Flash was a pop rock band popular in the 80s, 90s, but they used a uh, saxophone and stuff like that. Excellent vocals, excellent production. So some of your stuff reminded me of Quarter Flash. And then, of course, the ska type of stuff that you're doing reminded me of... Like Pretty Little Liars reminded me of No Doubt or Sublime or Real Big Fish, you know, bands like Mm -hmm. that. And I I really enjoyed it. But here's the thing. People listening now are going to say I sound stuck up. I sound like an a-hole and everything else. All right? (laughs) Here's the deal. I'm in my 60s. I have a gold and platinum album from Atlantic Records from the 80s. You think exactly the way that producers, musicians, engineers thought back then when I was actually doing something with my life. And the point is, you and Barry hit the nail on the head. Technology's good when we don't overuse it, and it's good for editing sometimes and stuff. But there's nothing like that analog feel. There's nothing like vinyl. There's nothing like one take off the floor, you know, all that kind of stuff. And for your age, I have to actually um, be very impressed with you because most people your age are all about the technology. It's not about knowing how to tune your guitar or playing or singing well. And I give you kudos for that. And the last thing I'm going to get in trouble for, and this is just my opinion, (laughs) my opinion, you hit the nail on the head. When you say to bands and musicians, you got to make a choice. It's covers or original. Covers are great. Keep your chops up. Yeah, you want to play bars, get people dancing. You know, you walk out of there with $13 a piece, you know. That's all fine and dandy, weekend warrior, love of music. I heard it all, okay? But if you want to do something with your life in music, not only do you have to write and record original stuff, but you have to know how to get it out there to the right people to market it, to sell it, etc., to make a living. It's a very, very hard concept, as you know. And I give you kudos for to even mentioning that on the air. So, you know, all the cover bands out there listening now are going to hate me, okay? Don't hate me, bro. Okay, I'm a realist, okay? I still get paid the rest of my life for what I've done in the 80s and 90s, and I can make a living off of it. Not great, but I can. You have to make a decision. Are you going to be a cover guy or an original guy? And, you know, that's it. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. End of story. Done. Well, thank you. I think that sounded great. Okay, well, Barry's quiet, so look out. <laughs> no, I'm on board. I'm on board with the original stuff. It's all I've ever done. I've done a few covers. I recorded a couple covers when I was 25 years old. Um, up for the last 30 years, it's all been original music. Um, I would never, I'm not dissing bands that go out and play 
covers. They need to make money. And, and I'm sure a lot of them that are playing covers are going, shit, I wish I could get in an original band or why can't we play the song I wrote? There's a lot of that going on. Um, but I wouldn't go in the studio and record, I, I, even though there's a million better songs out there than my songs, I still wouldn't record uh, uh, waste waste my money going in a studio. And, and another thing, there are some great covers that have been recorded some very few that are better than the original, but 99% of them, uh, the originals are the best. You just can't get by that because it was the first time that we heard them. Um, but, but, you know, bands have to do covers to keep playing. I get that. And, uh, you sneak, they, maybe they sneak their odd originals in, but, um, I, I would easily sooner go see a, a live, uh, original band than a, than a cover band, uh, playing uh, the Rolling, covering the Rolling Stones or whatever, and, and you know what? And there's a lot, and 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 that's entertainment. They're not doing anything wrong. Cover bands, that's entertainment. People want that can't afford to go see the Stones, that um, this can't go see the Stones because they're not touring in the area. They could go see the Blushing Brides, or they could go see a cover band, and that's wonderful too for for the people that want to go see the Rolling Stones. So it all works out in the end, good. Personally, I'm an original guy as well, but um, but definitely, uh, and, and there's a lot of bands uh, making money doing covers as well, and and that's good because it's hard to make money doing originals. Um, and uh, and when I played, I played an awful lot of cover songs when I first started out uh, playing live gigs too, and I think most of us did. Uh, that's how you start out until you, you know, you kind of get tired of them. I remember my drummer Randy saying on stage one night looked at me and he said, Bear, if we have to play Margaritaville one more time, I'm not going to come back tomorrow night. Because he was an original guy too. But, you know, you know what I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. and uh, But nor here nor there. Uh, I think we're all on the same page with that, Matt Gunn. It was wonderful to have you on the show. As I said, I'm going to follow your progress. Keep me posted where you're playing. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you again at Sir Monty's. I know Robert and Matthew, who own Sir Monty's Brewery in Curtis, absolutely love you. So hopefully, I'll be seeing you playing there again. And it's been an honor to have you on the show, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I had a blast. Yeah, thanks for listening. I don't, I don't oh. have much opportunity to talk. I just played well. We're, we're glad that you're here, folks. Get out and buy a couple of, check online for Matt Gunn's uh, music and, and buy a couple of his albums and, uh, and you won't be disappointed. Also to the listener, I say thank you for being here and always dance and sing and let the music bring your soul to the surface for all the world to see. Until next time, have a shuffle your feet kind of week and good night. You've been listening to This House of Musicians on Reality Radio 101. Thank you.